Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is The Eternal Benefits. And it is part of the Relationship with God series. It was presented in Bathurst, New South Wales, Australia on the 16th of June, 2012. This is Session 1, Part 2. <clears throat> so what, what we've been doing is we've been talking about our relationship with God and not so much how, how it's maintained, uh, but rather the benefits of maintaining it. And we, we can discuss more about how it's maintained, perhaps, or even answer some questions tomorrow about how it's maintained. So what we were thinking of doing tomorrow was just having a question and answer session where anybody can ask any question they like. So, but today I'd like to continue with this uh, discussion of the relationship with God and the eternal benefits of such. If you look at what we've already discussed, you can see that God um, is basically teaching us a number of things when we enter a relationship with God. Firstly, God's teaching me how to love. So God will not engage my addictions. God will want me to heal my addictions. God does not engage my fears. God wants me to heal my fears. God doesn't engage my grief in the sense of pander to my grief. God wants me to release my grief, have a good cry and get, get it over and done with. That's what God wants me to do. And in that process, God te is teaching me how to love. Not only how to love myself but also how to love other people and also how to love God in, in, in that interaction. But another thing God is teaching me is this quality of humility where we have to become real with ourselves and everyone around us. So God's teaching us through this process of how to become real, how to no longer have, no, no longer have a facade with the way that we interact with people. And we interact in a real way with individuals where people can see our personality and see our nature and if we disagree with them, we will say that we disagree with them. And if we, we like what they're saying, we'll say we'll like what we're saying rather than, rather than withholding it just because we were worried that they might you know, manipulate us in some way in the future. So we don't hold on to facade anymore. And God's teaching us how to no longer hold on to a facade. God's teaching us how to get rid of our pride. Pride's a huge impediment to learning. You know, if we, if we already believe we know, then we're not going to investigate further. We, and when we already believe we know, we already believe that we don't need to listen before we engage something. So God's, God's teaching us how to deal with our pride. Not by browbeating us and not by saying to us and not, not by going in such a way of like punishing us for our pride, but rather just not engaging us when we're in a state of pride. And that's how God teaches us a lot of things, by not engaging our unloving behaviour when we have it. And, uh, and this helps us to work through a lot of issues in our life as a result. Now, I just would like to reflect upon this humility for a moment. Humility is essential in any relationship. Do you, do you understand why? Like if, if you have a relationship with another, another person, if you can't be yourself with the other person, do they ever get you? Obviously not. If they can't get you, who are they having a relationship with? They're having a relationship with a facade of you a thing that you're putting on with them. That's not the real you. So when you're humble, you're willing to be the real you. When you're willing to be the real you, you'll present, you'll present the real you to another person and now they can have a proper relationship with you. You can also have a proper relationship with another person. When there's no pride in the relationship with the other person, you will listen to them. You will let, you, you will let them have emotions about you and you'll allow yourself to absorb those emotions. You'll allow yourself to feel those emotions that they have for you. 
and you're humble enough to feel them, even if those emotions they have towards you are not very pleasant. So if they're angry with you, you let yourself feel their anger with you. Right? And that's a very humble place, and it allows you to establish and, and maintain relationships under the, under the most difficult circumstances. Now, in teaching us humility, God's demonstrating that we also need to have humility with our relationship with God. Because how can you expect to learn anything from God if at the same time you already believe you know everything God's got to teach you? Can you see you have to allow yourself to see that, no, I know very little in comparison to what God knows. And as a result of that, it, 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 it would be wise for me to listen to, to God rather than, rather than to um, believe that I know everything before I engage that relationship. So I suppose that brings us to the question like, how do we hear God? Doesn't that? Right? And how does God hear us? Right. Well, the reality is that I can have many thoughts in my mind and you are able to hear them. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever experimented with that with somebody? It's, it's worth experimenting with somebody about it. Here's a good experiment to engage. Have yourself and a person who you don't know very well sit next to you or stand next to you and you just focus on allowing yourself to feel your own thoughts and to, and to actually think your thought and just have one thought over and over and over again. When that happens, um, there is this energy that comes out of you that anybody who is sensitive to it can pick up. Does that make sense? And they can actually feel the actual thought that you had and it, interpret it into words, into language, and express your thought. And it's worth experimenting with. Now, one thing that's easier than that, though, if you think about it, is when a person has a feeling at you. Have you noticed that it's a lot easier to feel a person's feelings about you than it is to read their thoughts about you? You notice that? So that tells you that your soul is really attuned not so much to thoughts but to feelings. So it's attuned to how people feel about you and how you feel about others. Now, if you can think of your soul as your heart, in other words, a, a part of you where you've got to actually feel it before it comes out of you. So, that, so we call that our soul. When I have a feeling in my heart towards another person, usually that feeling is written all over my face, isn't it? If it's a sincere feeling, you often see the feeling in the person's face. But you can actually feel it as an emotion coming out of them towards you. Have you noticed that? So we all, we all are fairly good with that when it comes to somebody being angry with us. Uh, most of us can interpret anger pretty accurately when it's coming out of us. But there are other emotions that we're not so sensitive to. Sort of emotions that are more um, what you would call refined or that require greater sensitivity before we can actually feel them. Is that not true? So when somebody feels ashamed, do you notice when they feel ashamed? And sometimes it, it, if it's a really strong shame, you might notice, mightn't you? But if, it, if it's not a very powerful shame that they have, you might not even notice it when they're in a discussion with you. And if I am completely blocked inside of myself to any shame inside of me, can you see how that would also then block me to the experience of shame that another person may have inside of them and therefore make me less sensitive to their feeling of shame that they are actually experiencing? But as a part of that discussion, you can see that if I have a feeling coming from my heart, from, let's call it our soul or our heart, it is very easy for most people, particularly if that feeling is very strong, it's very easy for most people to feel it that are around me. Any person who sees me or connects me with me in any way will probably be able to feel that emotion. Now, 
for most people, we require our sight to be engaged before we feel, unfortunately. Have you noticed that? Like, you have this strange sensation and then you look at somebody and then you realise why you have the strange sensation because I've got a feeling being projected at you, you that you like or you don't like and you instantly feel that. Does that make sense for most of you? If you've had those experiences where you've, you feel like you're being looked at, have you ever had that experience where you feel like you're being looked at by somebody and then all of a sudden you make eye contact with the person you've, you've been... And now you know the feeling they're projecting at you, right? And sometimes it could be pleasant or sometimes it might be quite unpleasant. It just depends on what the feeling is. But we now feel engaged with the individual. So obviously we are very sensitive with regard to our soul in the sense of we're able to sense feelings and emotions that are projected at us individually in particular. Now, obviously, this method of communication that we have is very powerful because if you think about it, if a person is just verbalising words towards us and they enter the air and the atmosphere and then they get transmitted into compression waves and then they enter the hearing of us, these words would just enter us enter our hearing, and then as, uh, as we have been programmed into a specific type of language in the particular country that we live in, we interpret these words as thoughts that are being projected at us. But have you noticed that every one of these words generally also have feelings associated with them that when we engage the person we can actually feel their feelings? So when somebody says to us, you're a bastard, right, if they've got a smile on their face and a feeling that you know, they love you at the same time, which often people in Australia have a sort of a... We often name people certain things while at the same time feeling quite nice about them. And we interpret their feeling rather than their words, don't we? And as a result, the, the words mean far less than the feelings. Can you see that? But if somebody says you're a bastard and he's got all this rage and all this like really angry emotions towards you, now you're interpreting it quite different, aren't you? Because of all of the emotion that you feel along with the word that's, words that are being spoken. But the problem with words is that you can say a heap of words and it can enter the mind of the person and the person can interpret them differently in their heart because of their own personal experience. That's the problem with words, isn't it? So a person can transmit words to us and say, oh, this, that, this, that, without any negative emotion, and yet there might be some association inside of us between those words and something that happened in my own childhood or something that engages a whole heap of emotion that's quite negative inside of me and that causes me to interpret something completely different to what the person has actually said. So the true power of our soul is not the words. It is actually the emotion that is transmitted between two people that it has the power. That's the thing that we even base our entire interpretation of. Unfortunately, though, we also have emotion inside of each of us individually that causes to mis us to misinterpret emotion. In other words, we go through this process of having feelings that maybe didn't come from the person, but rather there was feelings they had for us that caused us to feel certain emotions. So, for example, many times a person can be loved and at the same time feel not loved but feel ashamed. Because, because the love coming at them makes them feel unworthy of that love somehow because of some past events or whatever that they have not yet released. And instead of feeling loved, they feel ashamed of themselves or unworthy. That's the effect that emotion can also have. So, if we summarise that in terms of what's happening inside of the soul, we can say that inside of the soul of mine, I have emotions that are going to interpret... And our emotions would include also desires, passions, let's call them longings. And I have the ability to feel these emotions 
But I also have the ability to feel those emotions projected from another person to me. In other words, from a source outside of myself. So others. I can feel the emotions. And the emotion projected at me causes me to feel certain things necessarily. When I say causes, it resonates with different emotions or experiences that I have had and then causes me to interpret certain things based on the interaction. Okay? So, for example, if you go to America and call someone a bastard with a smile on your face, there's a high likelihood you'll get a smack in the face. Right? Because they're not, have, they haven't had the same background as we have here in Australia with the same kind of interpretation of that kind of emotion with that statement. Does that make sense? And so they often would feel angry instead of just smiling it off or laughing or whatever along with us. Right? Now, that being the case, if our relationship with God is such that it refines everything, which it is, there must be a way for me to actually, and there, there is obviously a way for me to feel God's emotions for me. Does that make sense? If I can feel your emotions and you can feel my emotions, it would make sense that God can feel both of our emotions, wouldn't it? Yeah. But also, God has emotions that come from God to us that we're able to feel. Now, if we look at it from a perspective of sci a scientific perspective, if God existed before the universe was created, then it would make logical sense that God exists outside of the universe. Does that make sense? So in other words, if God existed before the universe was created, then, the, then God existed without the universe being present. So therefore, God must exist outside of the universe. I'm not saying that God hasn't the ability to enter the universe. I'm just saying that God must exist outside of the universe. And the universe, in, in its creation, got created... And God can then enter that universe or exit that universe as God sees fit, obviously. But the universe existed after God existed. So let's put the universe here. Now we are in the universe, are we not? So we are a little person, little ant, if you like, in this universe. Now, if, if I can feel an emotion from you and we can be in the same room, that's one thing. But if you're on the other side of the world, then, and I can still feel your emotion, that's quite different, isn't it? Now, how many of you have experienced that you've felt the emotions of somebody else on the other side of the world? How many of you experienced that? Yeah? And many of you experience it when you get a feeling of, oh, I need to call a phone if your mum or father is overseas or something, I need to phone mum and dad. And that's because there's an emotion being projected at you <laughs> that they want to contact you generally at that moment and you can feel that. And so you feel instantly the need to, to engage that. Now, if we can feel the emotions of people that are not present with us, when I say present, I mean in our physical location, then it would make sense also that God is totally able to feel emotion whether God is in our location or not. Now, if that's the case and we're in the universe, then that means that every emotion that I feel is able to be transmitted to God and it actually can exit the universe. And for it to happen instantly, it means that it has to not be constrained by time or space. So in other words, if I have a feeling inside of myself that I project at God and God can feel that feeling immediately, then that means scientifically, from a scientific perspective, that means whatever I am projecting at God has to have exited the universe and entered God for God to feel it. Right? And if that is the case, and that's just a supposition, if that is the case, then obviously every feeling I have in relationship with God, can be felt by God. Now, if we take that one step further, 
we also then have the potential to feel every feeling God has for me. That would also make sense, wouldn't it? If you and I can feel each other, then surely God can feel us. But conversely, surely we can also feel God. Right? Now, if we can feel God, and our feelings are the truth of what we interpret in our relationships, and they are. So in other words, it's not the thoughts or the words that we mostly interpret in a particular relationship that we have. It's the feelings we feel from a person or to, towards the person that determine whether we are in a relationship or not. Can you see that? We can say all of the words of love, for example, and mean none of them. And the other person can feel that we mean none of them. And so therefore we're not really in a true relationship. True relationship gets established through having feelings that actually cover a distance between ourselves and another person and enters the other person and their feelings for us cover a distance wherever that distance be it might be right next to each other or it might be way away and enters us and there is a cycle of feelings going on feelings inside of me for the other feelings inside of them for myself now if that's what creates relationship what I'm suggesting is that we have exactly the same relationship with God and if that is the case, how do we actually hear God? So if we rub all that out and ask the question, here is me in this potential relationship with God, how do I hear God? The only real way that I can hear God is by actually feeling God's emotions. And how does God hear us? The only real way God can hear us is by feeling my emotions. God, God feels my emotions. And that is prayer. It's the feeling of the emotions that I have for God that God hears. And the answer to prayer is the feeling of God's emotions towards us as an answer. So there's prayer. And this is God speaking. To me. Now can you see that if I'm incapable of feeling any emotion... <laughs> because of whatever damage I've received during my life about all sorts of things that might have affected me in feeling emotion, then I'm going to have a lot of difficulty hearing God speaking to me. And if I'm incapable of feeling my own emotion myself, then very little prayer will exit my soul and enter God. I have to have a feeling associated with my prayers before God can feel them. So God can see all of our thoughts. I'm not saying that God can't. But what God feels is how God reacts, not what God hears. Do you see the difference? Just like in your relationship with another person, you do not react to what you hear. You react to what you feel from them. Exactly the same thing happens. You react to what you feel from them, and as a result, you then can feel what their intention is. You can feel what they feel for you. Sometimes it can be good, sometimes it might be quite unpleasant. But you can still feel it. And, and the same applies what other people feel from you. So if that is the case, then it would make sense that the method of communication with God does not involve thought and does not involve words, but rather involves Feelings and emotions. That makes sense so far? Now, if I am going to have a relationship with God, one of the benefits of this relationship with God is that I am going to become more and more sensitive 
to feeling God's emotions on every possible subject that I could ask a question about. So I can ask a question about, let's say, the human soul. Does it have a soul, mate? You know, is what AJ is saying about the human soul, does it have a soul, mate? I can ask that question. And if I'm sensitive enough to feeling God's emotions on the subject, I will be able to get an answer to that question very rapidly. The problem we have, and this is a major problem that we have on the planet, is our lack of sensitivity. Emotionally. So the more desensitized we become emotionally, the more difficult it becomes to sense another person's emotion. The more difficult it becomes to sense another person's emotion, the more difficult it becomes to have a relationship with them. One of the most, if you look back on your relationships, the most frustrating relationships generally are the ones where the other person hasn't got a clue of what you're feeling. Aren't they the most difficult relationships to maintain? You can, it's like you're having a relationship with a brick wall, basically. Now, the only way that we can become sensitive to what another person is feeling is by firstly become sensitive to what we actually feel. But as we do that, we grow in our sensitivity. We then become we then have a stronger ability to sense and experience emotion, to actually sense and experience feelings rather than have just thoughts all the time. Now, as a result of that, you can see that, you can, you can see that if that is the case, a relationship with God should make us more sensitive to emotion. It should make us more sensitive to feelings. We should be able to accurately determine over a period of time, we, we should be able to accurately determine the feelings of our own and of others and even accurately feel God's feelings for us at some point. And as we grow in our relationship with God, this is what actually happens. You will eventually be able to feel God's emotions on all sorts of subjects. This is a very rapid way of determining truth. If you can feel God's emotions about something, then you can feel what God feels about it and therefore be able to determine whether your feelings are in harmony with those feelings or not. In addition, due to the sensitivity of your own soul growing, your capacity to experience emotion growing, you will be able to accurately feel other people's emotions you can actually get to a point where you so accurately feel their emotions, you can feel the very moment they entered them. You can actually you can tell their history to them without having to have a conversation. Do you understand? Yeah. This is one of the capacities of our soul. To be able to sense other people so strongly, and ourselves as well so strongly, that we finish up, being so close to everyone that we can feel exactly why they were angry in that particular moment and what emotion it related to from their childhood or from their life experience that caused them to feel angry in that particular moment. We can feel the flavour of the anger even, whether it was projected as to a woman or to a man on who created it inside of them as a result. And we will even be able to trace them back to actual events in their lives and actually recall to them events in their own life that trigger the emotion for them again. This is the capacity of your soul. It has the ability to do these things. Now, every single person who reaches at one moment with God can do these things by themselves, without any external assistance. So in other words, every person who reaches at one moment with God can automatically feel the emotions of every person around them and also know why those emotions exist in that person. Now, can you see that's a fantastic way of knowing a person? Because the person could be saying a heap of things to you, but at the same time you could be feeling a whole heap of different things which are the truth of the interaction. Can you see that? And that's a very powerful eternal benefit to your soul because instead of seeing things as they are 
presented to you, you actually see things as they are actually occurring, which is exactly the way God sees them. God sees things as they actually are, as they're actually occurring. And in the end, the more and more we become sensitive to this emotional process that's going on, we finish up being able to do exactly the same thing God can do. And that is to be sensitive to everything occurring around me and know why it's actually occurring. Not why everybody thinks it's happening, but why it's actually happening. Now, to me, that is a huge benefit of having a relationship with God. You now have the ability to understand every single interaction and every single relationship in your life completely. Because you can feel every one of them completely. So you can get up in front of a group of 50 or 100 people and feel every single person's projections at you. Now, some people go, I don't know if I want to do that, but... <laughs> depending on this projection. But it's actually a very beautiful state to have because what, what you finish up doing is you, you finish up relating to each person exactly as you can feel are their emotional, is their emotional condition, which is obviously a very loving thing, obviously, that you can do for another person. So if you think about it from a, in terms of summary of that, God is speaking to us through her feelings, through her emotions. To hear, her, to hear God, we must be sensitive enough to feel her emotions. How do we speak to God? Through our emotions. We must be sensitive enough to know what we emotionally feel in order for, to, to actually have the correct message being going to God of what we want to portray. When people pray with their mind, you know, when they say a prayer, you know, like, for instance, our Father, art in Adam, how would be thy name? That, that's a common prayer that we know from the Bible. And it's only coming from the mind. Can you see God sees that as well? God can feel that. God can feel that there's no sincerity in it. God can feel that there's no interest in it. God can feel that there's no meaning to it, really. That we don't even, perhaps, even believe what we're saying, even. God can feel all of that. So from God's perspective, it's pointless doing it. If there is going to be no sincerity and no meaning and no emotion in it. Can you also see that emotions also are a lot about our desires? So if our desires are pure and motivated by love, God can easily feel them and answer those desires. But if our desires are not very pure and motivated by addictions, then God will want us to challenge our addictions so that we don't have them anymore. So the answer will be very different. And if, and if I can feel God and her answer, I will know when I'm getting answered with the words, No. <laughs> In comparison to the words, yes. right? Because I'll be able to feel God's emotions through that process. And then when the answer is no, and I want it to be yes, then I can see that I must be out of harmony with truth somehow. And I can therefore interpret truth through this process. So, I eventually get to the stage where I so, can be so sensitive that Every truth that God knows, I can, by having this emotional experience with God, be able to determine what is the truth and be able to absorb that truth from God. Now, if you imagine what truth there is available to you in an infinite universe, there's truth about physics, science, mathematics, health, the body, the mind, the spirit body, the soul, laws. There's all sorts of truths available in the universe. And what we're saying is through this personal connection with God, you'll be able to find out every single one of them with one proviso. It'll be if you're sensitive to the answer. Does that make sense? 
Now, like I said earlier, you can be sensitive to one answer and completely oblivious of another, depending on the particular emotional injuries that you have within yourself at the time. So, we, so if, if we ask some questions and we believe it's with sincerity and we get no answer whatsoever, then there can only be a couple of problems. One is that we're not, sent, not, we're not um, um, sincere. And the second is that we are not sensitive enough to hear the answer. <laughs> that can only be the two possible problems in our interaction with God. Because God, like every loving parent, wants to give us answers to everything we ask. There you are. Is it on? Is the mic on? Got to be educated in the desk before you can use the desk. <laughs> okay. I forgot what I was going to You forgot what you wanted to ask. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of questions. Sure. Just based on what you're saying. Um, so you're saying that the way we communicate with God is through feelings. That's pretty clear. Mm-hmm. What about. Uh, those among us who feel like God communicates through signs, through dreams, through uh, events that happen in our life, through relationships, through other people saying things. That's the f- there's, yeah. So let's answer that first, shall we? Okay, the reality is that God is capable of communicating to us directly through, our, through emotions and feelings. That is the method by which we actually have a relationship with God. However, for the majority of us, we don't have a relationship with God. So God can't use that method to communicate with us. So what God does instead, God says, right, that's the pinnacle of my relationship with you. This is how I'm going to communicate with you. But if I can't communicate with you that method, then what I'm going to do is all of these other things. I'm going to give you signs. I'm going to give you um, other people giving you thoughts other people talking to you in words. I'm going to make situations occur to make you get to a point where you're more sensitive and so forth. And all of these things that could occur in our communication with God occur only because we're yet to be sensitive enough to actually feel God's actual emotions about a particular subject. Does that help? There was a second part of the question. Uh, the second part is about you were saying that as we grow towards God, we become more sensitive. And you were talking about being able to feel other people's emotions. Something that occurs to me is that as we grow towards God, all of our sensory experiences become heightened because of this sensitivity. So yep. isn't it true that our potential for experiencing pleasure also exponentially increases? Exactly. And not just p- things like... Um, Sexual pleasure, uh, um, physical pleasure, in relationships, pleasure, emotional pleasure, is any yep. kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All of those things, because we're more sensitive, we now feel them to a heightened degree. So one of the primary benefits of having a relationship with God is that you become more and more sensitive to everything, and you feel it to a heightened degree. So any pleasure that you feel, you're going to feel to a heightened degree more than you could feel that before. Yep. That's a natural result of the relationship. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, what, does, what does it actually feel like when you're communicating to God? Because there's been a few times where um, I have like pins and needles, like I feel like an electric shock, and I don't know if it's God or if it's somebody else or, yep. or what it is. What's the actual feeling for you? Um, the only way, the point, there's a certain pointlessness to describing a feeling that's in another person without you having the feeling itself. 
So what I would suggest is this. Instead of describing the feeling, my suggestion is to experiment with the feelings and see what you believe it feels like as a result. So, so for example, what I suggest you do is to firstly understand that God is going to communicate with you through emotions and feelings. So, so that's number one. I have to at least have some personal acknowledgement of that inside of myself. That it's going to be my feelings, sensations... And emotions that God is going to communicate with me with. That's number one. Number two, I must come to terms with the fact that God has much stronger emotions, sensations and feelings than I have. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? If God is an infinite being, then and I'm a very finite being as, and I'm growing, but I'm still finite, it would make sense that God is far, God's emotions and feelings and sensations far exceed my own. Now, if that is the case, I must whenever I experience God, I am generally going to be overwhelmed. So, I must, number two, I must ex understand that I will be overwhelmed by God's feelings. Does that make sense? So if I'm having a feeling and I'm not overwhelmed by it, it's a high likelihood it's not coming from God. Can you see that? Because God is a much greater being than any individual or any spirit-based person that we could connect to. It would make sense that every time God connects to me, I'm going to be overwhelmed. And it doesn't matter how far into the future my relationship with God progresses and how large I become I'm still going to be overwhelmed because infinite in comparison to large is still like a there's a large differential between those two states right so the feelings that God projects at you if you fully allow yourself to experience them you will always be overwhelmed by them emotionally overwhelmed does that help yeah all right so we understand, firstly, that God has all these feelings, sensations and emotions and many of those are for us individually, right? Because we are a child of God, so therefore God has specific emotions and feelings for each one of his children. We must understand that because God is in a much larger place and God's much bigger than what we can intellectually or even emotionally at this point conceive, that every time we're sensitive enough to open up, up ourselves enough to feeling God's feelings and emotions, we are going to be emotionally overwhelmed by the experience. So that tells me that if I am feeling a sensation and I'm not over emotionally overwhelmed by the experience, I'm yet to really feel it as God feels it. Does that make sense? Yep. 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 So this is a great way of actually working out whether you're connecting with other people or other spirits rather than God. When you connect with other people or other spirits, there will be much, much less of a tendency, depending on their condition, there will be much less of a tendency to be overwhelmed. Although, if you think about it, if I'm down here in the first dimension and I connect to someone in the second or, th or third dimension... Obviously, there's two dimensions of existence of love. The difference in love is two dimensions apart. So obviously, when I feel that person, I'll possibly be overwhelmed. But when I feel God's emotions, I'm just going to be blown away. Can you see that in terms of the difference? Now, obviously, a person who's in the fifth dimension of the spirit world feeling emotions for me, I will feel as a much stronger feeling. Does that make sense? If I'm sensitive Emotionally, I will feel that. What often happens on the earth, though, is that because we're desensitized from emotion, we do not like ever being overwhelmed by it. And so what I see a lot of people doing with their relationship with God is they desire a relationship with God. They start to feel some of God's emotions, just a dribble of God's emotions start to enter them, and then they start getting overwhelmed, and what do they do? Shut it all down. They turn it all off. 
And so, and so in that place, we're, what we're doing is we're shutting down. We're basically saying, yeah, God, I want you to feel for me, but only that much. That's really what we're doing. And obviously, God doesn't like being controlled with her feelings as much as you don't like being controlled with yours, in the sense that God wants to share all of her feelings for you. Right? And it is really... In the end, our willingness to engage the experience of being overwhelmed that is going to determine how much of God's love we are going to have the capacity to absorb. Yeah. So what I find is that most people on the earth uh, have a very limited capacity to absorb the emotion. If I go back to Igor first, if I can do Igor first, if that's all right. Um, if, so God, God has this, the, the beauty of God's feelings for us is that they are always going to overwhelm us, but we limit the, our capacity to experience that emotion. We, we shut it off. We try to detune from it. And when we detune from it, what we're doing is we're automatically putting a block in our relationship with God and unfortunately, automatically putting a block in our ability to experience all the eternal benefits that come from that relationship. And, and what I feel a lot of people are doing on the planet uh, are they want a relationship with God but on their terms. And God doesn't work that way. right? Uh, just like you don't work that way generally when other people want a relationship with you, but on their terms. You generally don't work that way either, right? And so what we want is to have a close, open relationship without it being on anyone's terms. We just want to have it to the full expression of the emotion. That's what God wants to do with us. And when God does do that with us, we are going to be overwhelmed every day time so we've got to you get used to being overwhelmed does that make sense now when you go into that overwhelmed state you will feel very very strongly who's giving you that emotion and in that space you can very rapidly determine whether it's a person a spirit or god in that place when you allow yourself to be overwhelmed but if you do not allow yourself to be overwhelmed, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to determine where that emotion is coming from because you will be limiting the strength of the emotion through your desire. You'll be shutting it down and so therefore finding it very, very difficult to determine where it's coming from. Yeah. Igor? I just wanted to share something that you mentioned to me before because I was trying to intellectually understand how does God's love feel? Is it, you know, that feeling, that feeling, you know? Yeah. And you said, Igor... It's the feeling that you never felt before. And it's, it's that feeling that you never felt before stronger every time. Yes. So this helped me understand so much. I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and that, that's the third thing I'd like to stay, say in this, is that as, when we receive divine love, when we receive God's love for us, it's a feeling, as Igor just stated, that uh, feelings... have never felt before. Now, every single time you connect to God and receive a feeling from God, it will be a feeling that you have never felt before, even in your last connection with God. You never felt it either. Does everyone get that? Each, each time you connect to God... It'll be a brand new feeling to the intensity that you have never, ever felt before. Even the last time you connected to God, it wasn't the same, as, or it wasn't as intense, I should say, as this time. And the reason why that is, is that every time we receive a feeling from God, our soul expands a little bit, right? It transforms our soul, and particularly when we receive God's love. It transforms our soul. It makes our soul bigger. Our soul now has the capacity to experience an even larger emotion. That being the case, when I long for love to enter me from God this time, it's going to be bigger than any other time I've ever had the experience, every single time. In other words, it's more overwhelming than it felt last time, this time. And so forth and so forth. And these, as my soul grows, each single time it's more overwhelming than the last time. And so 
when the emotions that we're feeling from from we're, we're longing to God to feel certain things, and when we feel these things from God, the way we can determine whether they're actually coming from God or not is by these particular things. Does it have the flavour of this as a part of the emotion? What I see a lot of people doing is they try to substitute relationships with spirits with a relationship from in place of a relationship with God. And what I mean by that is that it, they often feel overwhelmed by God when they begin the process of trying to connect to God. And because they are so frightened of being overwhelmed, they would prefer to have a relationship with a spirit than they would with God. And so what they finish up doing is, in, is an, a group or a single spirit comes to them every time they ask for God and they connect to that spirit instead because they, uh, they don't want to feel that sort of uncontrolled feeling of being overwhelmed every time they connect to God. Does that make sense of that? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, so also if, if um, the kind of outcome is to be connected with God all the time... Of course. ...then how would you able to be able to do anything as in you just be so overwhelmed you just <laughs> be in a state of overwhelmness all the time um there's two different things you're describing now one is the actual reception of divine love and the other is a connection with god right and the two things are different to each other most people are mi uh, still misinterpreting what i'm saying to them they, they think they're both the same thing. The reality is every single time we receive divine love from God, this is what is going to happen to us. Right? But we get to a point, once we've received enough love from God, we get to a point where we have exactly God's thoughts and feelings about everything in our environment, as God has. Now once we get to that point... We can be in a state where we're not receiving divine love in, a, in the moment, but actually connected with God permanently all the time because we have exactly the same feelings that God has on all these different matters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yes. But when we're actually receiving, remember that you can continue to receive divine love beyond the point of becoming at one with God. Right? And when I say, so the term being at one with God... What that means is we've made this transition into being completely God-reliant. We've made the transition into a complete state where we now have no impediments to our desires for God. In other words, there's no emotional blockages that prevent our desire for God. And on top of that, we now have God's thoughts and feelings about everything that's going on in our universe that we're aware of. We are in harmony completely with God's thoughts and feelings. But that's not the same as continuing to receive divine love. Because when you receive divine love from God, you will every single time, even after you're one with God, as the saying is, every single time after that you will still be overwhelmed. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yep. If we just come down to Alex and then to Mary. Yep. Um, what you're describing in, in the last two and a half years, I've had three or four periods, I call it, of two or three weeks where I have this and, and it exactly is what you're saying. I get to a point where um, I want to shut it down because it's, I'm constantly crying, basically. Yeah. It's just constant, constant overwhelm, it's constant crying. So... What I just want to ask is, it, is it just a state, do you just need to constantly release more fear about, about control, about the, the desire to control, to be overwhelmed? Well, if we're constantly crying and there's a certain sadness or grief associated with the crying when we're receiving divine love, the reason for that is that there must be still grief-based grief emotions inside of us that we need to experience. Does that make sense? Once we become at one with God and we actually receive divine love, we might cry, but it will be emotions of joy rather than grief. Does that, you can feel the difference between the two of those emotions. So you know how sometimes in a certain interaction with an individual, you can get to a point where you feel so much joy that you just feel like crying. 
Well, that, that's the kind of interaction with God that you have after you're, you're at one with God. Before you're at one with God, when you receive love, it will, re it will trigger inside of you any grief that exists in there. So this is how it heals you, by triggering the grief and, and helping you experience it. When it does that, you will obviously go through an emotions of grief and it's just a matter of how long you can endure them as to uh, how much benefit you'll have from the experience. Now, for a lot of people, if they say they've been just crying for a few hours, for most people that's far too many hours. <laughs> If you look at the average person on earth, when they cry for 15 minutes, they feel it's a bit too long. Um, it's very rare, in fact, for people to cry for, for long periods of time on earth. As a result of that, we are constantly limiting, because we're controlling the overwhelmed state, we are constantly limiting the healing capacity of that love entering us. And so my suggestion is, once you get into the state where you are feeling the emotions and you can feel that it's pure and you have that connection with God, the key is to, be, to submit to the connection for as long as possible. Now what will happen is you will submit to it for a period of time and then certain emotions inside of you, which are very stubborn, will start to take control of the process. And those emotions, you, you'll get to a point where those emotions finish up shutting down the process and then it's a matter of you working through your blockages to experiencing those emotions before you'll have the next experience. What I find happens with uh, most people is that that period can go on for many months or even years where you're blocked completely to experiencing God's love even more than you have. So what we become then is very used to God's love being in a certain condition uh, but, but we don't get overwhelmed yet about any more because we're very resistive to take the next step, which is about releasing the blockages that we have to that love flowing. And the blockages will be based around our addictions and the different belief systems that we have that we need to release that are out of harmony with love. And then when you get to that state where you've released those, you then have a desire for God's love to enter you and you have another overwhelming experience and that will last as long as it lasts... <laughs> Until such a time as God's love's entered you to such a point that you, the next set of blockages that you have get exposed. And then the process stops and then it's just a matter of how long is it going to take for you to work your way through those blockages before you have the next experience. And it could be years sometimes. If we're really resistive, it can be hundreds of years. There are many people in the spirit world have hundreds of years through that process. Of course... If we get used to this as an idea or a concept and we actually emotionally get used to this, not just intellectually, can you see that it will be a lot more rapid? Um, but the problem is usually also that the very last group of emotions we must release to become at one with God are also our toughest emotions. And for that reason, they also take the longest to unblock ourselves with. So, so we can go through the experience initially quite rapidly, and then the more tougher the emotion gets, the slower we get, until we hit the point where we're, we're, we're really resistive about one or two major things. Once we get through that phase, then we'll become at one with God and you won't be resistive to anything anymore. And that's the deepest level of your resistance that you'll ever have to go through. Does that make sense? And the beauty of what God does with this process is God's just constantly like squeezing our soul, if you could like it that way, just squeezing our soul, getting everything out of it that's, in, that's an impediment for God to give her love to you or put her love in you. And, and the process is a very fluid process as a result of that. But you also have to be patient with yourself because... There are the very last group of emotions that you need to release to become at one with God will also be the most difficult emotions you've ever had to release. Yep. Yep. And who was you had your hand up there, or, or you've forgotten your? I th I think I answered my own question. Um, just so that I'm not talking, but I'll ask a real question. Yeah. Um, I feel like. My most significant block to God is the fear of my own emotions, is the fear of this state that you're discussing. The fear of being overwhelmed. 
Yes, yes. constantly. Mm. Um, and I feel that is, is that a major blockage for everybody. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. Is that the same for everyone? Yeah. yeah. I, feel, I feel the main reason why people want to control the relationship with God is because they don't want to be overwhelmed by God. And so they enter this state where they shut down themselves constantly. As soon as God starts to connect with them and they start to have a longing for God, so God starts to connect with them, then they start feeling overwhelmed and then they want to shut it all down and go away. And it seems to me so sad because it's actually just the fear of my own pain that is preventing me receiving love. It's it's not just the fear of their own pain. It's also the fear of being out of control in a relationship. Yeah. That, that's the biggest fear probably that most people have. It's not just the pain, but the fear of being constantly out of control. The relationship with God is going to cause you to feel constantly out of control to a degree. And therefore and, vulnerable and, to harm. And, and therefore, yeah. poten- well, no, the only reason why you would interpret it as vulnerable to harm is because of some unhealed emotion. Um, but in my, most people initially very afraid of being out of control in a relationship. You look at what happens in an average relationship when you're a teenager. How many of you have had a teenage relationship with the opposite gender or same gender, sexual-based relationship, yes? Teenage one. What was it like? Can you remember? Did it, it felt pretty awesome. It felt pretty awesome. But it, one, why did it feel awesome? Could, could you think about anything else? No? What, what if we have some describe like an event? Well, what event? Yep. First thing we um, it was just all consuming. That's all you ever thought of. Exactly. It was like the whole world was around this one person. Yep. And it was so emotional. And, and if, your heart was really totally oh, exposed, yeah? Totally open. And, you know, if they rejected you, it was that the worst thing in the world. And you'd cry for weeks and listen to sad music <laughs> for months. <laughs> yep. Yep, I agree. So, so can you see why we avoid that kind of relationship after that? Yeah. We usually get hurt in that relationship at some point, right? Due to some kind of unhealed emotional experience for one or both of us in the relationship. And then as a result of that, we hold on to that hurt. And the very next time we engage a relationship, we engage it with far less openness. Have you noticed that? And then as time goes on, oftentimes in a person's course of a person's life, they'll engage each relationship with less openness because, they've, because they've, it, the hurt is building up as they go through their life. If you think about what God's trying to do with us in a relationship with us, is God's trying to put us back in that place, back in the place where we, we are totally involved in the relationship with God all the time, right? And, uh, and we can't really think about much, uh, many other things. The irony of the relationship with God, though, is that we finish up knowing all other things and therefore being able to experience a lot of other things. It enriches our life. It doesn't draw from our life. It enriches our life. Whereas often that experience when we're a teenager draws from our life and doesn't enrich our life aside from the love area. The rest of our life turns into a mess. And... Whereas the way our relationship with God works is very different to that. And true love is like that. It engages every aspect of our soul and enriches our life as a result. But we will have that feeling that I'm describing, that you've described, the feeling of being constantly overwhelmed by the relationship and, and, and your heart totally involved in it. Now, you think about how much judgment the world has towards that state. What do most people do when they see a teenage couple in that state? What do you notice? They make comments like, um, oh, that won't last. Yeah. Or it's just teenage love. It's or just teenage it's crap. Just, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they belittle it. They're condescending towards it. Anything else that they often do? Many. I, I remember my father. He was very angry with it. Right? So they often project rage. Right? Disgust. Yeah, you get a room type of emotions, like so sexual disgust. Can you see? We have so many, when we're open like that, we have so many emotions projected at us that it's very, very difficult to maintain the state while you're feeling all of these other terrible emotions being projected at you. So, what God's trying to do is He's trying to help us go through all of those emotions so that we've released them, 
so that we can maintain a state like that with God firstly and then secondly with our soulmate. That's what God's attempting to do. And, and if you allow God to do it through this process, you will be overjoyed by the results, just as you were when you're a teenager in love. Does that make sense? You'll feel the same kind of feelings. But the majority of us are so disillusioned by love as a result of our life and disillusioned by the attacks we receive when we're open-hearted that we've shut all that part of us down. And as a result, when God tries to give us love to the degree that God wants to give it, we are constantly fighting God and trying to push their love back again. And that's a very sad state that we've entered when we're trying to reject the very love that will heal us. Um, that's, that's quite sad. But it's understandable given what's happened to us in our life generally. The key for us is to go, okay, I've got to expect, emotionally expect, that overwhelm is going to be my constant state. Yeah. And that every feeling I have from God is going to be bigger and you know, more intense than the last one I had. And if I know that God has feelings, sensations and emotions for me and I allow this overwhelmed process to occur, then I'll progress very rapidly. For the majority of us, what we do instead of that is we control it because we love control. We love control because we're frightened. And so because of our fear, it finishes up determining how fast or how close we get to God. And God's challenging our fear all the time as well. He's trying to help us overcome our fears so that we no longer control. Yeah. So does that answer the question about how God communicates with you and also what you can expect in this development of this relationship? Because of that, the relationship expands and causes your soul to expand in its capacity to experience not only emotions, but also its capacity to absorb knowledge and to absorb information of all sorts, not just emotional knowledge, but intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge and knowledge of all types. It, it causes your soul to expand enough that you can absorb new ideas and concepts without being resistive to them. That's what it does. So that's one of the eternal benefits too of this relationship with God, this ability for God through this relationship to cause your soul to keep growing and to keep changing, keep growing, keep changing. Now, can you see if little me is very, very afraid of change, I'm going to struggle with that process. You see that? Yeah. But if I can learn to embrace change and actually enjoy change then I'm going to have far less struggle with being overwhelmed all the time by God's emotions. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I'm a um, serial sign seeker and uh, I, I noticed little amazing coincidences. So a serial, <laughs> you know, I just write that down, sign seeker. Is that how it is? Well, they're actually your words, but... Um, no, yep. I, I sort of resonate with that. So, so to me, that's God. I notice, you know, incidences of coincidence, which are, are so amazing that that it's um, got to be God involved in that. But yep, one thing that's just what you're talking about there was um, the subtlety of it is just so um, incredible. Mm -hmm. And um, is that what you mean? When well, can I firstly address this whole idea of being so a serious can I just, Sorry, scientist? sorry. Yeah. The fear, is that what you're talking about? I, I, he's only giving me or what I can handle. Yeah, so, basically so. there's constraints that you've placed around God and God's, God's emotions for you. And, and as a result of those constraints, God can only show you things or tell you things through the use of signposts, if you like. 
right? So there, there are things that you've learnt to interpret as coming from God over the period of your life. So for some people, it's like certain numbers. You know, when you see the number, yeah, right, then it's a major sign for you, right? For another person, I know it's this number. You know, and so forth. And they sort of say, every time they see that number, there's a sign again, there's a sign again that God's involved, involved in my life. Now, the reality is when you're connected with God all the time and, and willing to be overwhelmed by God all the time, you won't need those signs so much because, you'll have, because you can connect to God directly through this connection and therefore you know God's always helping you through your life and guiding your life through every experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so you're not so focused on the sign, you're more focused on the feeling that God's giving you. And what God does with you with this sign is every time you see this sign, you let yourself have the feeling. Have you noticed that? So whenever you see 207, you let yourself have the feeling that God's present in your life somehow here in this moment, right? Yeah. And that overwhelms you. Mm -hmm. so, so God's helping you through this by saying, okay, if that's what it takes for me to give you the sign that I'm with you all the time, then I'm going to do that as often as I can. Right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reality, though, is once you work your way through the, fact, uh, the overwhelmed state of the fact that God is with you all the time, you will then realise God is with you all the time and be even more overwhelmed <laughs> than just overwhelmed every time you see the sign. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so there's no harm in seeing the signs, of course, but, but it's just an indication that the complete relationship with God is still being limited by something, and so God has to give me some signs to, to demonstrate to me God is present because, because I'm not seeing it all the other times that God's present. Yep. Um, so can you... It's so subtle. That's what I'm sort of getting to. It is. Uh, it's almost like the, it's. You know, why isn't it more obvious? That's what I'm basically saying. Well, God's not the kind of person that wants to hit you in the face every time. Mm. That's not how God works. God, God wants you to be more and more sensitive. You see, you see, the reason why God can control the entire universe as she does is that she is actually sensitive to absolutely everything that is going on in the universe. So, for example, if, if the smallest of insects dies, a little bit of energy comes back to God and God is so sensitive that of all the insects in the universe, God can still feel that one insect has died. So that's how sensitive God is. Okay. So God can feel every single tiny little thing that lost life, things that we are not even able to feel ourselves, God can sense and feel immediately in amongst all of this entire universe, God can still feel that one thing has lost its life. Does that make sense? Mm. Now, what God's trying to do with us is to cause us to become that sensitive where we also can start to sense every single little thing that is happening around us in the same manner. Now, if God come along with a brick every time and knocked you over the head and said, now, notice that... You would, after a while, get very, very used to get knocked over the head with a brick every time, um, and therefore probably not very sensitive to what's going on around you. You'd have to have some other external stimuli in order to see what's going on around you. What God is trying to do is the opposite of that. God is trying to make, to make it so that your soul is so sensitive that you observe everything going on around you without anybody having to knock you over the head with it without ever, anybody having to push something in your face and say, look, here, look at this, you notice it already. And to do that, God has to help you to understand how God communicates with you and how all of these other things communicate with you. It's through the flow of feelings and being so sensitive to those feelings that you can determine every nuance of them. Now, to do that, God has to teach you how to become more sensitive and how to feel even smaller feelings. Does that make sense? Yeah. More and more smaller feelings, right down to the infinitesimal. Mm. God is trying to teach you how to feel. And, and God's not going to be able to do that with a hammer. Mm. 
God God needs to do that through a process where you become sensitive to the feelings, and that's why God uses it in that. That's why God communicates in that method. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you you wanted to? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take over everything. Look, um, I was wondering what you felt about uh, people forming groups or working towards releasing their emotional pain in ones and twos or, or uh, finding a therapist. Like, I did primal therapy in the 70s, right? Yeah. And I had an incredible support at yeah. a, a centre and it, it made an enormous difference yes. to my rate of progress. So I was just wondering how you felt about seeking, people seeking out Help with an other, with others. Yeah, I, I feel that it's great to get help from others. Can I just uh, put some provisos with that? When we receive help from others, we need to make sure that the assistance that we're being given is in harmony with the principles of love. Now, unfortunately, what I observe with groups, if we look at groups specifically, or you know, teams of people, like two people working through something. If, if members of the group are still willing to stay in their addictions, you can eventually finish up creating addictions between members of the group. I've seen that. Yeah. And that is very counterproductive to the relationship with God. Because what God is trying to do is to break down our addictions. So if the group is a group that is actually not fulfilling our addictions and actually helping us in a loving environment confront our addictions, then there is no harm in the group whatsoever. But if the group is supporting some of our addictions, for instance, we might have an addiction to be heard, for example, and everyone in the group will all shut up whenever we speak, um, then that's not confronting the addiction that we have to be heard, and therefore is going to prevent us from uh, some progress in our relationship with God. If the group said, okay, we've noticed that you seem to have this addiction to be heard and then they start to help you in a loving manner to address the addiction, then that's a very positive experience and that's always going to get you closer to God. So help needs to be given by people who are in a, in a loving state, I suppose you could say, and people who, are, who, who can see the difference between addictions, fears grief and actual healing based love based emotions that need to be healed now if the group is in that state then they're always going to assist our relationship with god if the group is in an addictive state they are actually going to help us destroy our relationship with god so it really just depends on the group or the individual mm. yeah yeah no yeah. because I, I saw in the in the primal group there was a steady move towards spirituality yep away from the crude emotions and pain that they suffered in their childhood. That, that was very good to see. Yep. Now, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that that existed in every centre, but yep. it certainly was in the one that I was at. Yep. You know, so. Yeah. And, and this is the thing, is the group can... We, we can obviously, uh, the problem with a group is we can become dependent upon it. And God doesn't want us to be dependent God wants us to be fully functioning adult individuals who are totally able to create everything in their own lives without dependence. To do that, we're going to have to release a lot of emotions to get to that place. But God doesn't want us then to swap dependence. See, what, what many of us do with groups is we have a dependence on our family or a dependence on our parents in particular, and then we swap that for a dependence on our wife or our husband. And then once we work through some emotions with them, we swap that for a dependence on a group or a dependence on a way of life or something. And God's constantly saying to us, look, what I would like to see, from this is, this is what God is saying to us, what I would like to see is that you learn that I created you to be this person that doesn't need dependence. I created you as a fully functioning, self-sufficient individual that is able to create its own life in complete harmony with love. But what I would like with you, God is saying to us, is a loving relationship where my emotions can flow into you and your emotions can flow into me. Now, as soon as we uh, have a group set up a dependency within us or we remain dependent we're now no longer understanding the truth about ourselves, and that is that we are able to be a fully self-sufficient, grown-up individual 
who loves and is able to give the gift of our love to any person uh, or, or anything in our environment. So, so my feelings about a group are, if the group is assisting you in your relationship with God, assisting you to break down the barriers of dependency, whatever you are dependent upon, and assists you to work through that emotionally, then the group is very supportive. If the group is assisting you to hold on to your addictions and hold on to your fears and to, to deny your grief or deny the truth about your life, then the group is not being supportive. Make, them, make the person dependent. That's, that is really dangerous. It is very dangerous, yeah. So, so for that reason, I very rarely get involved with groups because I, I see a lot of the times there's just heavy involvement of addictions in, in groups. When I am involved in groups, I confront the addictions in the group, which often means that I get kicked out of the group. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what happens many times. But when we're in a relationship with God, um, we become very, very focused on that relationship specifically and everything else becomes like a vehicle that we can use to, to become closer to God. And as we become closer to God we automatically become more loving to everything in our environment, including every group. Uh, but we do see the truth of the group. We don't, you know, we don't ignore the truth in the group. We, so, so if we noticed a group um, in, in working in something and then we noticed it was a bit out of harmony with love or it was in an addiction or avoiding some fear or avoiding some grief, then we would not allow that to continue and participate in the group without saying something in the group. Yeah. Um, if we go to Igor. <coughs> I just wanted to um, <coughs> like classify addiction. Is it fair to say that addiction is a seeking out of the same particular feeling, same old particular feeling over and over again, which blocks us to the new, um, to the new uh, emotional experiences? Yeah, sure. Let's uh, just describe a little. Now we're sort of getting off the topic a little bit, but, but it does... We need to understand that addictions need to be confronted in our relationship with God. One of the eternal benefits of our relationship with God is that we will eventually remove all addictions from our relationship with God. And, and we will remove all addictions from within ourselves, and addictions to anything. And so we need to understand how we can see addictions. So, so generally, most of us have some grief of some kind. And over the top of that grief is fear to experience the grief because we feel the grief is too hard or harsh to experience. And then because we, we're also so afraid, we don't want to feel fear. So what we do is we create addictions to specific emotions to avoid our fears. Now, we become what is called needy. right? And when our needs are met, we are happy. And when our needs are not met... We are sad and angry. Huh? This is a normal process of addiction. Now, God knows in our relationship with God, God knows that this is the healing emotion. Grief is the healing emotion. We need to grieve and let things go to completely heal from them. And God knows this. God also knows that fears cover our grief. You know, we, we are so afraid and most of our fears are false expectations appearing real to us in other words uh, because we don't we don't acknowledge God's truth on the matter so we want to hold on to our own truth which is often an error and as a result of that we create an addiction an addiction might be anything to do with emotions it can even be physical in nature like it could be addiction to alcohol drugs smoking coffee you know all sorts of things can we create as addictions to avoid certain things and the determinating factor is if we are needy for the addiction to be met, what will happen is when it is met, we will be happy. And when it is not met, we will be angry. Right? And so this is a sign to us. And God doesn't want us here, by the way. God doesn't want to connect with us here. Because that's where all the facade is. The, the, the person who's not real is there. What God wants to do is to go beyond all of this down to the real person which is buried underneath all of this. That's where God wants us to be. That's what God wants a relationship with us as we really are. So God will not assist us to meet our addictions in any of our relationships with him or with other people. 
So, so whenever we try to have an addiction met with God, God will always refuse the engagement of the addiction. And, you know, this is when we often get angry with God. Start swearing at God and get cursing God and saying, why isn't God doing this and why isn't God doing that? And that's a really good indication that we're not allowing ourselves to go into these other levels with God, like to go into our fear and our, into our grief. So, so um, in terms of the question, Igor, when it comes to the addictions themselves, they are actually more to do with emotions of neediness that we have within ourselves that we want an addiction met rather than confronting the fear. And, and it's our preference to not confront the fear that creates the addiction. And God wants us to confront our fears. In fact, God knows that none of our fears are real. None of them are real from God's perspective. Like God is not in a fearful place and when we become at one with God, we will never be in a fearful place again about any matter, including our own death or any other subject. So as a result of that, God wants us to confront our fears and, and, and release them so that we don't have them anymore. He doesn't want us to stay in this state where we continually get our addictions met over and over and over and over again because we want to avoid the fear that's underneath the addiction. He doesn't want us to remain in that state. And if we remain in that state, we can never be at one with God if we decide we want to remain in that state. Yes, um, Lena, thanks. Just on this, um, if I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly. So if I'm seeking a feeling through my addiction. If you're seeking a feeling to be met through your addiction, yes. I'm no longer, because most likely through, because it's an addiction, the feeling is, uh, for example, I'm smoking somewhere I'm feeling quite unhappy and sad and unloved. Yes, there's so something you're afraid of feeling. Yeah, yeah. and if I'm, if I'm going ahead with addiction, I'm no longer feeling the feeling of unloved. Exactly. And therefore, I'm actually not wanting God to love me, but I just want... Well, actually, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get... We're smoking, right? Let's say in the example you've given, we're smoking not realising that the whole reason why we're destroying our own body and our own life, because that's what we're doing when we're smoking, is because we don't love ourselves enough. And if we just felt how bad, much we don't love ourselves and cried about that, then we would actually start to feel God's love for us. Mm. But it's our lack of sensitivity. We're, we're trying to block God from, from loving us because whenever God loves us, we'd have to have a cry. And, and we don't want to cry. And that's what is the underlying problem. The underlying problem is we do not want to be overwhelmed with grief or with fear. And that's why we turn to the addiction every time. So the smoker goes for the cigarette not for any other reason than he wants to avoid the fear or the grief. That's the only reason. And the, my, who knows what it's about. If he stopped taking the smoke and just sat and felt, he'd probably start feeling what it's about and how bad he feels. So the answer would be still with God. So any feeling that I'm actually lacking inside, avoiding to feel the lack of the feeling, so feeling quite unloved instead of, instead of love, and ideally the answer is really with God because God could perfectly love me. Well, no, it's not only that God could. God it already does. does. It's just I cannot feel it because I'm blocking it. I'm pushing it away. I, I'm trying to reject God's love because every time I feel some of God's love, I'll have to cry. And that's the whole reason why I'm smoking. I don't want to have to cry. <laughs> Do you see? It's sort of like a catch-22 situation where, where we're chasing our own tail, preventing, preventing ourselves from being healed by, ta by engaging in addiction, which in the end, if we no longer engaged, we would be able to feel the fear and grief associated with it and actually release it and then ironically we'd feel that God actually loves us and we could actually feel that love enter us and that's just what I feel is quite sad with addictions every time I see a person go for the addiction it's just immediately it crosses my mind is it's sad because you, you, you're just avoiding the emotion that prevents you from, from feeling loved now like you, you're just avoiding the emotion that prevents you from feeling God's love and therefore no longer needing the addiction at all. 
And our neediness to create the addiction is all about feeling good without processing the grief. We want to feel nice without actually feeling bad first. That's what we want to do. And that's what, what we need to do to heal is if we feel bad, we need to feel bad and cry and then we'll release and then, then we'll feel good. But we don't believe that. We don't have that belief system. That, and one of the beautiful benefits of God, I feel, of the relationship with God is, is that in the end it heals, heals me completely. And that's fantastic. If you think about every single painful emotional experience you've ever experienced, all of them at one point in your life in the future being gone completely from you, what do you think that state would feel like? It would feel pretty good, yes? And that's what God's love does. And this relationship with God is the only thing that, in my experience, I've ever seen do it. There are many people I've seen uh, and talked with in the sixth dimension of the spirit world who believe themselves to be happy. And then as soon as I start talking to them about some of their childhood events on earth, all of a sudden they start feeling sad again. And then they don't want to talk to me. So it's a pseudo-happiness. Because the reality is, once you've healed it emotionally, you won't have a pseudo-happiness anymore. You will have a real happiness and you'll be able to talk about the sad experience of your life without getting sad. You'll be able to talk about them from a teaching perspective or whatever, any other perspective as an actual occurrence in your life. You'll be able to remember them without feeling bad. And that is an indication that it's healed. And once you become one with God, every one of those emotions is healed. Now, I see that as a major benefit. There's, a, there's a stages to the benefits of my relationship with God. The first one is that it heals me completely. And then the second one, I feel, is that I then grow eternally. Now, if you think about growing eternally, like... You know, what we know, observe on earth is, a, is that a child, a little baby child is born, right? And we, they're in our arms and then a few months later they're a bit heavier, a bit harder to pick up. And, uh, and then, a, then three or four months later they're like a little toddler now. A year or two later they're now this high, you know? And then, and then before we know it, as most of you parents know, um, they're this high. And then we stop growing physically, Yes? Well, what I'm saying is in our relationship with God, we have the ability to continue growing. Continue growing, not just soul, but physically and spiritually as well. Continue to grow, to get larger and larger and larger. right? And, and, and in particular, the growth is going to occur at the soul level. And if you think about that, the first step in my growth is to heal me the second step of my growth is to now discover everything else about me and the universe around me. And that can be done after we're healed even. A lot of that can be discovered because we're now absorbent. We're now like a sponge sucking up all of the experiences that we're having and being able to understand them and, 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 and engage with them. So I see that as a major thing. I'm no longer as well constrained by time. So there is no time anymore in my life. Do you, do you know what I mean? I'm, I mean this in a literal manner as well as a, a, a spiritual one. When I say there's no time, what I mean is that I can have instant responses to my desires because all of my desires have now been brought into harmony with love. I now can instantly desire something and have it instantly fulfilled. I don't have to wait. But also there is no time in the sense that I am also patient, ironically. So if something does take some time, I'm not impatient and I'm not trying to force it to happen. In addition, there is no time in terms of going from one place in the universe to another, in terms of transporting myself. I can instantly across the threshold of the speed of light and transport myself from one location to another when there's no time boundaries. Does that make sense? These are all the things that a person at one with God is capable of doing. And, and so there is also no space, really. 
And when I say no space, it's, it, there's a physical sense and a, and a feeling inside of me that I'm not attached to a specific location in space. I'm, I'm happy to experience space in a larger degree. Um, I can see distances as if they were present with me right now. So in other words, I can imagine myself even in the future and see myself as that person now and see where I'm headed even through that process. So I don't, I, there's no tyranny of distance either. In the, in the spirit world, and everyone who's become at one with God in the spirit world can actually instantly transmit or move themselves from one location in the universe to another location. Instantly. Without any time uh, dis between those two points. So, so you can have the thought or the feeling, it actually is more to do. The feeling is, I want to be in Greece, and instantly you're in Greece. Yes. Uh, and then you have the feeling, I, I want to be in Mars, and instantly be at Mars. Uh, and these are just physical locations, but they're also spirit-based locations you might want to be. So because you're now at one with God, you can, you can go to any dimension up until the eighth dimension of the spirit world. So you can instantly go, oh, I want to go and talk to somebody in the eighth dimension of the spirit world, and bang, you're there talking to that person. And you remember every experience. Uh, that's the capacity of the soul once all of these things have happened to it. So from my perspective, I sort of see like all of these advantages... I don't see any disadvantages of having a relationship with God, right? Except maybe some of, some of us might think, oh, I might have to do a bit of crying or whatever. So what? Like, comparison to all the advantages, what's the point of worrying about how much crying you're going to have to do? Nothing like a good cry. Nothing like a good cry, yeah, exactly. So, so the reality is that our relationship with God, and, and actually um, myself and Mary the other day, we just... We just listed all of these different advantages of having a relationship with God and just over the period of about a half an hour or 40 minutes or so. And um, we wrote some of them down, which we've included in an outline that is downloadable on the net, or will be once I've loaded it. Um, we come up with five pages of 27 things in that period of time of advantages and benefits of having a relationship with God. And many of them I have not covered in this discussion. So my suggestion is to, once that's on the web, just to download it and have a look at those particular points with regard to that. Because you'll find there is just so many benefits to having a relationship with God. Many of them are physical, spiritual, soul-based in nature. A lot of them are to do with your own pleasure. And a lot of them to do with, uh, with the pleasure of other people in, in terms of in the universe that you will meet. And... A lot of it is to do with being in harmony with everything around you and understanding everything around you. And, and so my feelings are if, if we fully engaged the idea that there are eternal benefits to us engaging a relationship with God, we would be far less resistive to engaging the relationship than we currently are. So we, we, would, we would, instead of putting it as like third, fourth, sixth, tenth on our list of things we do today, we'd be putting it as number one thing we do every day. You know, we, we wouldn't, and we'd also be fin finish up in this state where we're trying or attempting to engage this relationship with God every moment as we're doing other things. And we become great multitaskers in that way but by, by actually engaging the relationship with God while we're engaging the rest of our life. And that's what I meant in the first century when I said, all these other things will be added to you. There was a quote, there's a quote you will read in the Bible sometimes, it's called, it says, seek first God's kingdom and all these other things will be added to you. What I actually said was, seek first God's love and all these other things will be added to you. And when I said all these other things, I specifically meant every single thing you could ever conceive of that you could possibly enjoy in, for the rest of your life can actually be added to you just by engaging this relationship with God. The relationship with God can bring you everything else. Everything else you've ever desired, ever wanted to experience 
that it, that was loving in its in its underlying desire, in sincere and pure in its desire, you will be able to experience through this relationship with God, if you engage the relationship with God. If you don't engage the relationship with God, then it will be a trial and error process, just as most of our lives currently are. The trial and error process as to what makes us happy and what makes us unhappy. And as a result of that, it will take much longer for us to actually enjoy and experience the things that we could possibly experience. So my suggestion is to allow yourself... Sometimes what I feel is if you allow yourself to really just sort of think about and feel about what I suppose most people today would call meditate upon, the... the concept that a relationship with God can bring you everything else and then make a list of all the things you've ever wanted in your life and ask yourself the question how does a relationship with God bring me that and you'll find there's an answer to every one of those statements that you've made if you engage that process the beauty of doing that is you eventually appreciate inside of yourself how important it is to engage that relationship as first priority. When we put it as our second, third or some other priority, we are automatically reducing our own effectiveness in growing. Automatically. And to me that makes no logical sense whatsoever. If we engage instead the first thing that's going to bring us everything else, then and put all of our effort and our emotion and our and our will into engaging that then of course we're going to reap the benefits of that much more rapidly than if we engage that down on our list so that's what i would love to encourage each of you to do and so that's the end of our discussion today what what i'd like uh, to do tomorrow is i want to ask answer more of your questions tomorrow and it's questions on any subject uh, so those of you who'd like to come, it will be 10 o'clock in the morning, um, uh, an unearthly hour of the day for a Sunday, I suppose. Um, so 10 o'clock, we'll, we'll do that from 10 till, two, uh, 10 till uh, 12, and then we'll have a break for about an hour and go from 1 to about 3, and uh, then we'll, we'll pack up and move on our way. Our next port of call from here is up near Armadale, and that's where we'll be driving next. But I'd like to thank you for your time today. And hopefully um, you've been able to engage the process of maybe realising the eternal benefits of having a relationship with God. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you.